50 years ago, it's been 50 years since the Kent State Massacre. Uh, I've been wanting to talk about the Kent State Massacre for a bit, um, look into really the deeps of what happened and why it happened. Um, as we do on the show, if you're familiar with it, I don't, I don't just go into sort of the, the, the generalities of it. I, I try to take a little bit of a deeper look at what was going on. May 4th, 1970. The general gist of what happened at Kent State University was uh, the Ohio National Guard opened fire on unarmed student protesters. Uh, four people were killed, a bunch of people were injured, and uh, it's, it's like a travesty. It's like a major fucking travesty in American history, as it should be, as it should be. There's no excuse for what they did. Um, so let's get into what happened, right? Why did, why did all this happen? So Nixon, um, Richard Nixon, old tricky dick, uh, promises that he's going to de-escalate things in 1968. He, he, he promises that he's going to de-escalate things in, uh, Vietnam, but that didn't happen, right? 1968, things, um, things start ramping up. There's more massacres, there's more protests. And finally in 1969, things do start slowing down. Uh, but on April 30th, on 1970, um, Richard Nixon launches the Cambodian incursion. He was going to invade Cambodia. Uh, and he did this without talking to his defense secretary or secretary of state, right? So he says one thing and then he does another thing. Uh, sounds like a politician to me, you know. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's like they don't call him Tricky Dick for nothing, you know. They don't call him Tricky Dick because his, his dong veers a little to the right you know it's just like it just moves a little to the right and he's got it and it's it's tricky it, the, it's no it's because um it's because he does shit like this he's a he's a swindler is why they call him tricky dick the 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 penis thing um uh they call him they call him old righty dong is why they uh what they call him for for that so it's a different that's a different nickname uh, that that one's not very well known. The, the old the old righty dong is, uh, uh, you know, and it's not as clever, either, you know. But I don't think, but he I think he he might have had the people that called him that uh, like killed, so uh, you know that's why it never makes the history books. But so he so he you know does the Cambodian incursion, um, doesn't talk to Defense Secretary Secretary of State, just kind of does it because he wants to do it. Um, and Kent State at that point was, uh, having some issues with protesters. What I mean by that is, um, Kent State as a university and organization did not like student protesters. <laughs> like they just hated them. Um, so, you know, they, they were seeing these protests propping up uh, across college campuses, but particularly at Kent State. There were um, these protests from Students for a Democratic Society and the Black Student Organization, right? They, in, in the middle of April, right before uh, the Cambodian incursion happened, uh, there was a protest because they were, uh, the university was inviting police officers to um, come on campus and run a recruitment. And the Black Student Organization and the Students for a Democratic Society were against this thing, so they planned a protest. They planned a protest and they planned a walkout, um, which was pretty successful until the, the police decided to clash with them. Um, my guess is, based on how history operates, is that the cops uh, felt threatened by these students, you know, walking out and saying that police recruitment should not be happening on, uh, on college campuses. Um, and they felt threatened by them and probably had a, a violent reaction. The students pushed back and the, and the campus, Kent, St Kent State University, revoked the students for a democratic union. They, they revoked them from having meetings and, and such. So there was there was a little bit of friction between the campus and the the student protesters themselves so um right after the cambodian incursion order was put into place that that happened on april 30th april 30th 1970 richard nixon puts the cambodian incursion order in place 
And uh, right as that happens, 500 students uh, protest and demonstrate um, on May 1st, like the day after, right? And this, this immediately gets dispersed because of what the demonstrations were, and I'll talk about that in a second. But they basically, once they were dispersed, the, the students decided to plan an anti-war rally and protest for May 4th um, and give them a little bit more time to like organize and plan what was going to happen, right? Um, so what they were doing is uh, they were burying the U.S. Constitution because Richard Nixon had killed the U.S. Constitution um, based on, you know, what they were saying it, it, with these illegal wars and um, his, his real aggressive and negative rhetoric towards any anti-war protester or any hippie or any, anybody that was black or anybody that just wasn't Richard Nixon. Anybody that wasn't Richard Nixon was kind of an enemy to the most paranoid president that we've pro possibly uh, ever had, you know. Um, so he, so bearing the U.S. Constitution was like a symbol that nurtured Nixon has has um, killed the Constitution, right? Uh, and then there were signs, and this one's going to come. This one's going to become important for a little bit later. There were signs that said, "Why is the ROTC building still standing?" There were these. They, and they posted these signs all over campus. Now, in the town of Kent, uh, the Kent police was alleging that there were people coming out of bars, you know, later at night, and they were throwing rocks and throwing beer bottles at the cops, and, and, then, it, and then things just escalated from there, and uh, all of a sudden there was this gathering of people uh, that appeared, and there was this, the, the, these bonfires, and everybody was just shouting obscenities at these cops, and, you know, all these Kent citizens were... We're, we're just kind of getting um, violent. Now, here's the thing. I don't know what this has to do with the protests, uh, but, the, but the mayor and, and the Kent police have connected those citizens with the, protest, with the student protests, um, maybe, uh, b basically saying that because there were student protesters, the, the, the citizens at these bars... Uh, were getting aggravated. They were getting, you know, violent. They were they were th chucking rocks and uh, beer bottles at the cops and, and things of that sort. So uh, the full brunt of the Kent police was called. They used tear gas to disperse everybody, right? Uh, ma the mayor of Kent, Mayor Le Leroy Satram, uh, he freaks out and he calls a state of emergency and he shuts down all the bars. He's just like, no more bars. <laughs> That seems to be the problem, right? People and people are just chucking rocks because, because of the bar industry. Um, look, we're we're kind of facing that in our society today, right? The second that they closed down uh, bars and restaurants, everybody just went into like total freak out mode. They were just like, "When is this going to happen? When am I going to be able to go out there and get a free get a drink? Because drink, drinking is my freedom. It's my freedom. That's all that matters. Drinking and haircuts. That's how freedom is represented." And they freak out, uh, and they and they get enraged, and that's what happened in Kent when when the bars were shut down, when the state of emergency comes into play. And I'm not justifying that that uh, Mayor Satram actually put a state of emergency in place because there needed to be a state of emergency put in place. Um, I just think that he was kind of scared and didn't know what the fuck to do, and he put in a state of emergency, and he was just like, "Bars seem to be a, th a problem here. Shut them all down." Uh, so he shut that. She, he shut down all the bars, um, and that enraged a lot of people. And same thing now is like when the bars and restaurants are shut down, people kind of freak out. And I gotta say, you know, me thinks that America might have a little bit of a problem. I think America might have an alcohol problem. You know, we got a, we got a little bit little bit of a booze problem in the old America, right? You can't go a day without uh, going to a bar. You know, people kind of freak out. They're just like, freedom, freedom is the booze. The booze is freedom. <laughs> I think America probably needs to find Jesus because uh, that dude knew how to turn water into wine. You know, I think that's why America is so obsessed with Jesus, right? Like, that's why the religious right has this obsession with Jesus is because we're all, like, America is just a bunch of alcoholics. And they're like, that dude knew how to turn water into wine. We got to find him. We got to because if he does, then he'll just make all the water into wine, and I'll, I'll just have all the wine all the time. 
and it'll be holy. So it's like good. It's like like being an alcoholic. It's like it's like that's how you get into into heaven is like by drinking like god wine, you know. You know how they say cleanliness is godliness? Well, well maybe uh, maybe alcoholness is also godliness. Maybe God's just drunk all the time. That explains the platypus. Huh? It explains platypus. <laughs> I feel like there's like a little bit of a problem. So this all happens on May 1st, by the way, right? Uh, the, the 500 students, they get dispersed. The townspeople getting rowdy getting dispersed with tear gas both instances and the mayor putting a state of emergency and shutting down all the bars on may 2nd uh mayor leroy satram started hearing these rumors there were these rumors going around that these radical revolutionaries were were threatening bars and restaurants and small businesses in the town of kent to uh, to say that if they if they don't put anti-war uh, uh, posters and things on their windows, uh, then then uh, these anti-war protesters are gonna burn down these small businesses, which obviously makes total sense, right? With uh, with war being the I think the the uh, ultimate highest form of violence. Uh, and these people being against the ultimate highest form of violence. Uh, and in order to show that you should be against this ultimate high form of violence, um, how do you get people to support by threatening more violence on them to show that you're against that violence? That makes sense. That's, uh, that's not flawed logic at all. I bet that's, that's totally viable. It's just, I mean, obvi, obvi, you guys. Uh, these are still rumors, by the way. And then there's other rumors that these revolutionaries, these radical revolutionaries, um, are going to poison the water supply with LSD. And now, honestly, you know, this doesn't sound that bad. My opinion doesn't really sound that bad. You know, if, if you do it properly, if you microdose the water with a little bit of LSD, it, it's been proven to uh, have very positive effects for mental health, uh, it makes you uh, realize that we are all one vibration flowing through the universe, ever expanding until we hit the utmost reaches of infinity and come back and condense back into one point. I feel like that's a very healthy thing for us, all of us to realize, right? And if, it, and if, that, if we're getting that from our water supply, maybe we won't be freaking out uh, when bars shut down. In fact, I talked about this on a, um, a stand-up comedy album of mine. Uh, the dude that created AA the reason why he created AA, the way that he created AA, is because he uh, took acid. So, I don't know. Seems like these revolutionaries just want us to reach a higher level of consciousness. So, because of all these rumors, right? None of this stuff is even true. Like, none of this stuff is even true, right? Like, the, no, there's no evidence that this shit was true they were just like i don't know i heard where'd you hear it from i don't know there's a guy he fucking he said it so it's got to be true maybe we should just act on it like it is <laughs> right uh the mayor called the governor called governor jim rhodes the governor of ohio and he ordered the ohio national guard to come in because of these rumors because there were these revolutionaries through kent doing all these things that don't make any fucking sense, right? Like, and they don't have any evidence that it's actually real. Like, they were just like, these gossips happened, and we should act on it, and we should send a, a, the National Guard in to protect people um, from gossip. But we're going to say the gossip is true. So we're not protecting people from the gossip. We're protecting people via gossip. So gossip some more, uh, you know. I feel like... Um, the real problem here is that Nixon's uh, paranoia might have been a virus and it just rampantly spread throughout the leadership of the country and everybody was way more uh, paranoid. I think what we, should, what we should have done is quarantine Nixon. You know, we should have just quarantined him in an underground bunker for five, six years. Would have changed the course of history. Probably for the better. 
you know, we would have probably been like, maybe we should microdose the water with LSD and uh, help people uh, see the truth. And, uh, oh, wait, was that? We should give health care to everybody uh, because putting a price tag on human life seems unethical and kind of crazy. And uh, no real logical society would do something like that. What? <laughs> so once the National Guard gets called and they show up into Kent, uh, the students at Kent State burn down the ROTC building. Not a good look for the kids. Not a good look for the student protests, right? This is like kind of a bad idea. Um, so after this happens, uh, Governor Jim Rhodes kind of freaks out a little bit. The ROTC building gets burned, fires get put out, uh, and uh, they realize that it's these anti-war protesters that might have done it, these campus protesters. Right. And this is sort of validating like all of these rumors that they've heard, right? Without any cur they were just like, that's it, that's the proof. That's the we nailed it. We figured it out, you guys see. They burnt down the ROTC building, so it's got all, all of it's true. The LSD thing is true. Uh, the, 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 the the threatening businesses thing is is tr is true. Uh, I, I even heard that uh, some of them um, are uh, you know uh, kidnapping babies. White babies, because this is 1970, and we wouldn't be reporting anything if it involved bl the black and minority communities. That's crazy. These are white babies that are being kidnapped by the anti-war uh, tre treasonous, lecherous bastards. I heard I had some guy. He fucking he said in the um, in a thing. I was walking down the street and he mentioned babies, and I was like, that's probably he's talking about babies being kidnapped by anti-war protesters. So I just kind of. I filled in the gaps where I needed to with my paranoia, you know. I just feel like this is like you made a decision uh, based on like Alex Jones conspiracy theories is basically what Governor Jim Rhodes did. <laughs> like we kind of had like what if what if what if uh, Alex Jones and like a like like an actual politician fused into one. That's basically what Richard Nixon was. Uh, and then he released like this paranoia virus into the country because that's essentially how they made their decision. They were just like, I heard stuff. Did you, were you able to like prove it? Did you like investigate? And he's like, ah, I just acted on fear. Uh, so once the ROTC building gets burned down, Governor Rhodes, he has this big speech and part of the speech says this. Uh, he said, we've, we've seen here at the city of Kent, especially probably the most vicious form of campus-oriented violence yet per per perpetrated by dissident groups. They make definite plans of burning, destroying, and throwing rocks at the police and the National Guard and the Highway Patrol. This is when we're going to use every part of the new law enforcement agency of Ohio to drive them out of Kent. We are going to eradicate the problem. We are not going to treat the symptoms. And these people just move from one campus to another, to, to the other, and terrorize the community. They're worse than the brown shirts and the communist element, and also the night riders and the vigilantes. They're the worst type of people that we harbor in America. Now, I want to say this. They are not going to take over the campus. I think that we're against the strongest, well-trained, militant, revolutionary group that has ever assembled in America. He's talking about kids in college. He compared them to Nazis and communists, and then he called them the most well-trained militia in America. This dude is ramping up fear for no goddamn reason. I mean, sure, the ROTC building thing was a little over the top, but is that what all the other anti-war protesters were talking about? To lump that one, uh, one instance of violence to all anti-war protests is delusional. Like, this is, this is just a bad idea. This is just stoking the flames of fear. And that's all this governor really fucking did. 
he's like he was like pounding on desks and stuff. Uh, the the recording has like him like pounding on desks. Just like I'm, how dare you? That's a bar to military. So based on that, um, he enforced martial law in uh in Kent. And uh, uh, you know he called these people Nazis and fascists. Uh, the most well-trained militia, and then he uh, enacts martial law, simultaneously eradicating the word irony from his brain. Now, at 8 p.m. after this martial law is put into place, uh, at 8 p.m., the students held another rally, right? And at 8.45, these National Guardsmen came out to disperse them, and some of them didn't want to go, and by 11 p.m., there was a curfew in effect. And uh, the National Guardsmen came back out and they were like, hey, there's a fucking curfew in effect. You got to go. And some of these kids were like, no, we're not going to go. We're going to peacefully demonstrate that we're against this martial law that the governors put out. We're against being treated like we are a, a fascist group because we don't want illegal wars to happen. We don't want these 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 lottery drafts to take place um, and endanger our lives, our teachers lives, our community people's lives. Uh, over a war that doesn't make any fucking sense. Over a war that, you know, is, is deemably an illegal war. Um, and uh, the National Guard, in response to that, uh, stabbed people with bayonets. Because that's what you do. Right? That's how you prove that you're like a a good police force there to look out for the community that you're that you're trying to protect people is uh is you stab them with a fucking bayonet makes a lot of sense so this is like one escalation after another from mostly from the side of uh the mayor the governor of the national guard uh I will say the ROTC building was um, a, a bit of an escalation from the side of the protest community. But other than that, I mean, if you count it, calling the national, uh, first of all, um, using tear gas to disperse peaceful protesters, that was, that was done earlier, twice. Then getting paranoid and freaking out to the governor over rumors, unsubstantiated rumors, and calling the National Guard. So now you have these uh, this militaristic presence in a small town. And then you have the National Guardsmen using uh, force to get rid of these protesters by stabbing them with bayonets. Uh, so that's four accounts of, of this escalation from the... Uh, establishment side and one account of escalation from the student protesters which is burning down the ROTC building so finally we arrive at May 4th right we've got all of these points of escalation we've got all this pushback a lot of aggression I would say most of the aggression has been from the authoritarian side uh, there has been one point of ag aggression from the student side uh, but again, for the most part, that was sort of a retaliatory thing uh, because they didn't want the ROTC building there in the first place. It represented like this military presence on campus, and that's what the anti-war movement was about. It was against this military presence in a country that they believed that there shouldn't be military presence for. So on May 4th at noontime, there was a big protest, right? There were these marches and speeches and rallies on armed students utilizing their First Amendment rights to speak out against the government, to speak out against what was going on. So the guardsmen wanted to disperse the kids, and they used tear gas to disperse these students. So the, the students, a bunch of them, uh, as they were dispersing, went up Blanket Hill is what it was called. It was this place called Blanket Hill, and they, got, and they were pursued by the guardsmen. Now, the guardsmen didn't have to pursue them, right? The guardsmen could have just been like, okay, they're dispersing, and that's it. But they, but they decided to actively pursue them up the hill. And once they came around from the hill, the students veered left. They went left um, to, you know, kind of go around the football field, which is on the other side of the hill. The guardsmen did not. The guardsmen went straight into the field 
and got surrounded by this chain link fence, couldn't see another way out. To their left are students, to their front is students, and they were just like, what the fuck do we do? Um, you know, these students are still chanting and protesting and such. Um, there, there are, I think there's, there's only one source, which is like the History Channel, which is so weird. Uh, but none of the other sources that I can find corroborate this. And I guess according to like one of the guardsmen, um, the protesters were throwing rocks at them and stuff. Uh, but none of the other sources that I can find substantiate that evidence. So it just kind of seems like, the, for the most part, there might have been maybe some people that were chucking rocks and stuff. But to be fair, they did just get tear gassed. Um, so, again, another point of escalation from the side of the establishment. Uh, the guardsmen freak out and they decide that they have to backtrack to go back up Blanket Hill to get a better vantage point of everything. So that's what they do. A bunch of these guardsmen start going back up. And as they're going up Blanket Hill, they're like paranoid. And they keep turning around and they like keep looking back at the students thinking that the students are going to come up and rush them. These are unarmed kids, by the way. They don't have any weapons or, uh, or anything. They, they have signs and they have chants and they have poems and shit that they're, you know, so... Then, all of a sudden, sar the what was recorded as uh, Sergeant Myron Pryor began firing his forty-five pistol at the students at twelve twenty-four p.m. So all this happened within a span of like twenty-five minutes. The protest started. They get rushed. You know, uh, National Guard in the chain link fence. Students on the student on the left, student on the front. They decide to go up the hill. Freak out for I don't know why and then once Sergeant Pryor starts shooting his pistol the other guardsmen go holy shit we must be under attack turn around and they start shooting with their rifles this happened for 13 seconds uh, and they fired 67 rounds they killed four people Jeffrey Glenn Miller who's 20, uh, Allison Krauss, who's 19, um, she, she died later, William Knox Schroeder, who was 19, also died later, uh, and uh, Sandra Lee uh, Schur. A bunch of people were injured, Joseph Lewis, John Cleary, Thomas Mark Grace, Alan Michael Canfora, Dean Collar, Douglas Allen Rentmore, James Dennis Russell, Robert Fullis Stamps, Donald Scott McKenzie. Um, these people, I mean, you know, one of them is paralyzed. A bunch of them just, you know, they got shot in the chest or the leg, neck wound. The last one's a neck wound. And they got shot in the butt. Like, these are... This is this is cra like this was crazy. Now, if you look at this, you go, well, something must have happened, right? Like something must have happened. The guardsmen must have seen something. Something happened. So they talked to the guardsmen, and the guardsmen said, "Oh, we were all fearing for our lives. From what? These unarmed kids with signs that say that they don't like your authoritarian presence." Or were you just being fueled by Governor Rhodes' speech about them being like the brown shirts? Which was an uncalled for comparison of all anti-war protesters. This was an act of, of, of parasitic paranoia is what this was. And it left four people killed and a bunch of people, a bunch of kids, four kids were killed. A bunch of kids were injured, unarmed, protesting a war, protesting actions like this, by the way. But, you know, again, Governor Rhodes removed the word irony, probably made it illegal in the state of Ohio. It's interesting. You know, 
that they were fearing for their lives. Nobody tell them about what's actually going on at the Vietnam War because that is going to freak them the fuck out. And they might get PTSD just from hearing what war actually is. They feared for their lives from unarmed kids expressing their First Amendment right. Words, speeches, chants. Nobody was pointing a gun at them. Nobody was stabbing anybody with a bayonet. They made their decisions based on three days of unsubstantiated rumors and a, and a sociopathic speech from a paranoid governor. Now, once this happened, you know, there's panic everywhere. And the rest of the students were, were like, fuck it, let's just, let's fucking do this. Let's, let's take this to the next fucking level. Let's retaliate. They wanted a counterattack, right? Their friends are, 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 are in the, ho- like, uh, need hospital attention. And they were ready for a counterattack. They were ready to, like, take, take on the National Guard of Ohio, the Ohio National Guard. And there was a geology professor by the name of Glenn Frank that pleaded with this group for like 20 minutes. And he said that this would be a slaughter. Like if you guys did this, if you guys rushed the group, like you are going to 100% give them another reason to fire shots. You're going to give them another reason to fucking kill you guys. And like, please don't, please don't do this. Um, So after 20 minutes, the students decided, I, you know, Professor Frank was right, and uh, students dispersed. Uh, you know, at, at that point, it gave the opportunity uh, for paramedics to come in and take the injured into hospitals and make sure that people were taken care of. The National Guard believed that there was a sniper somewhere. That was never proved. Uh, the response to this protest, to what happened, uh, was a was abysmally garbage, like the Nixon administration couldn't have fucking given a, a worse response to this. Um, his press secretary, Ron Ziegler, I believe his name is, Ron Ziegler. He says this: when dissent turns into violence, it invites tragedy. So essentially, saying that if you choose to dissent, it will turn into violence. And then that's going to invite tragedy. So don't dissent. Just listen to what we say. Go along with whatever the fuck we feed you, right? We're going to spoon feed you the information and you just believe all that shit. Don't think about it. Don't counteract it. Don't have this critical thought, this free thinking, skepticism, bullshit. None of that shit matters. Okay, you spoon feed it and you won't have any tragedy. We won't have to, if you didn't protest, we wouldn't have to call the National Guard. We wouldn't have to send people with guns to battle your signs. That's because of, that's on you guys, is basically what the Nixon administration is saying. The governor turned this, turned to violence. And the administration, the expansion of war caused by the Nixon administration, by, by the military industrial complex, by the bloodthirstiness of American exceptionalism, is what turned that day into a tragedy 50 years ago. Nixon referred to anti-war protesters as bums most of the time. And uh, one of the girl's dads, uh, Allison, Allison Krauss, her, her dad was like, my kid's not a bum. So he's insulting like kids that stood up for a cause and died because of it. And he's like, yeah, she died because she's a bum. What, what, like a, what a heartless thing to fucking say. <laughs> You know what the crazy part is, is if you look at Nixon, right, for as horrible as he actually is, he would kind of be considered liberal as a president in today's, by today's standards. By what the Republican Party and the Democratic Party actually do and what they stand for and how they operate, Nixon would kind of be a liberal. EPA, he had an open refugee policy. He had a much more lenient immigration policy. He hated black people and hippies and anybody that wanted to go against his war so that he could dominate with McCarthyism and military presence and create a war economy. He was against all that, but, but that's just been heightened by the Republican and the democratic party.
And if you look at that, if we look at it within the context of that, right, Nixon called anti-war protesters bums. What did the Democratic Party look at protesters and strikers as? They don't look at them as, as good people that they need to stand up for. The Republican Party doesn't like protesters. They don't like activists. I mean, you can go all the way back to this point with that shit. So then there were more more protests across the campuses, right? I mean, this this kind of exploded. This became public knowledge, and things just exploded everywhere. There were all these protests all across campuses, like in New Mexico. Uh, the New Mexico Guardsmen shot some kids <laughs> because their life might have been in danger, too. They were holding up signs. Holy shit. You know, what if those words became drugs? And then what if those drugs didn't turn water into wine? I don't know why I turned into Bill Clinton there for a second, but uh, Bill Clinton would definitely not like these kids. The worst of these uh, were uh, Jackson State in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, something called the Jackson State Killings. Basically what happened in, in Jackson, Mississippi, which is already like, it's a pretty segregated town. You know, there, there, were, there were upheavals of, uh, between the white community and the black community. Um, and uh, there was, a, there was a, a, a civil rights activist that was rumored to be killed, that was rumored to be, to be dead. Uh, Charles Evers, he was a civil rights activist, and there was rumors of things uh, within the rumor mill that he had, he had been killed. And uh, that sparked uh, some mildly violent protests and people kind of, um, you know, setting up a bonfire in the middle of the street, uh, throwing beer bottles and things of that sort. Um, nothing, nothing worse than what the Kent citizens did. And uh, eventually the cops showed up. They used the tear gas. They dispersed everybody. And there was a bunch of student protesters on Jackson State's campus in front of a woman's dormitory that were peacefully protesting and rallying um, against the war and, 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 you know, because of the death of, uh, the, the, the supposed death of Charles Evers. Cops moved in and uh, they opened fire. They opened fire on these student protesters. And again, we got asked, well, what the fuck happened? Why did these people open fire on a bunch of peaceful protesters that didn't have guns? And the cops' response were, well, we don't know. We, we, we thought we saw a sniper. There might have been a sniper. We don't know. We thought there was a, th we, maybe, you know, you never, I don't know. Maybe I thought about it. And I, made, I thought I saw something shimmering. There, there were these black people. And then I saw a window. And I was like, oh, black people plus window equals sniper. Duh, obviously. That's just a logical train of thought that everybody has is they see a group of black people and then they look at a window and they're like sniper 100 percent for sure that's the only logical conclusion it can't just be a window with nobody in it there has to be a sniper in there so we decided to kill everybody uh two people were killed a bunch of people were wounded primarily black peaceful protests Cops fear for their lives. You've got to ask that question, right? Why does law enforcement keep fearing peaceful protests? What is it about these peaceful protests that these cops keep freaking out about? These National Guardsmen and these cops, they see peaceful protesters and they're just like, this is a life-threatening situation. And like, this could erupt into a war right now. I better take it into my own hands and I'll make it a war. I'll shoot some people and turn it into a war. That'll be me. I'll do that. Right? That's... We're going to have... Why, why? What is it about these peaceful protests that, these, that the law enforcement is so afraid of? Is it, is it the fact that, you know, the protesters are propagandized against? that they are considered to be brown shirts and communists and enemies of the state, that if you protest against the, the, the pro-war, hyper-militaristic, uh, manifest destiny of the globe, American exceptionalism bullshit that, that this economy preaches, 
that they look at protesters as traitors and treason, treasonous. And much like the governor of Ohio said, he is not interested in treating the symptoms. He's going to eradicate the problem. And how do you eradicate the problem? You got to kill what you perceive to be the disease, which is anti-war protesters, which is anybody that dissents against a government putting forward authoritarian legislation, putting forward authoritarian laws. Maybe that's why you think that your life is in danger because of peaceful protests. Is it because the police and the guardsmen are trained to be violent, to reach for their guns first instead of looking for a de-escalation method? Is it because of hyper-masculine machismo that, that you can't talk to somebody? You can't try to understand where they're coming from. You can't try to figure out what their point of view is and see if you can talk to them and say, hey, this is disturbing the peace, which I mean, it's really not. They're exercising their First Amendment rights. Okay, well, we're going to be, you know, 500 feet away from you and we're just going to keep an eye on things. If things get a little crazy, we're going to have to intervene. It talking like that is seemed as pussy shit. You know, you got to you got to fucking you got to stand upside down and beer bong and shoot an AK at a target that's moving and that's how you prove you're a man. Cops. Or is it all of the above? Or is it that the whole law enforcement industry is a bunch of paranoid, overly violent, hyper machismo boys with guns? That's what the law enforcement has become, which is a problem within law enforcement and military and the National Guards and all sorts of stuff. Systemic problem. So why we see more racial violence towards black people and minorities in this country from, from law enforcement itself because of all those problems. Now, how did the public react to this? Right? There must have been outcry from the public. 58% of the people blamed the students. 58% of people blamed the nonviolent student protesters unarmed, nonviolent student protesters for getting shot themselves. Boy, victim blaming was sure popular, huh? What a fun thing to do. 31% of people that uh, didn't have an opinion one way or the other about what happened. 31% of people saw unarmed, nonviolent protesters and said, yeah, it happens. Yeah, it's just the way things are. What are you going to do? I got to fucking watch... Uh, Whatever is on the boob tube. Hopefully some boobs. You know, they don't call it a boob tube for for no reason. Am I right? Am I right? Are we done with the interview? 31% of the people had no opinion. And kids getting killed by the American government. This is the reason why we have seen a rampant expansion of unexcused militarism because there is not enough people standing up against it. There are a lot of people that are bending at the knee at military massacres under the guise of patriotism. 58% of people blamed the students because they thought they were unpatriotic. That's insane. How many people today think that way? I would say it's less than 58%. I would say that because there were 58% of the people that blamed the students that looked at anti-war protesters as bums, as, as Nixon liked to call them, and now we know the truth about the Vietnam War, that it was an illegal war, and now we know the truth about the Gulf War, that, that was an illegal war. Now we know the truth about the invasion of Iraq in 2002. And what we, what we are doing in Afghanistan and Libya and Syria and Yemen, we're all, they're not for patriotism. We're not for, for, for nationalistic pride. 
or to eradicate the world of terror, but it is about global manifest destiny to ensure that we take what America believes is theirs when it's not. And it's all for profit. And over the last 50 years, over the last 50 years, we've let this rampant expansion of the military industrial complex because it started with 58% of people looking at unarmed, nonviolent protesters and dying because it was their fault. Not because of over militarism, not because military presence exists in our own homes, in our backyard, and is doing the same thing that they're doing overseas. It doesn't surprise me that, I mean, it doesn't surprise me one bit that we look at what happened at Kent State, we look at the public reaction of Kent State, and we look at how someone like Julian Assange is being treated for showing that America <clears throat> killed civilians in the Middle East, were ordered to kill civilians, and journalists, two routers journalists were killed. That was revealed by WikiLeaks and Chelsea Manning and Julian Assange. And we look at them as the bad guys. Instead of, why is the American military murdering innocent civilians? They're claiming it as casualty of war, but it's not. Is this a casualty of war? Is Kent State a casualty of war? How are you going to justify that? Did anybody condemn Governor Jim Rhodes for it? For creating this... this atmosphere of paranoia <clears throat> and vengeance towards anybody that that uses their mind to dissent against a government that is actively willing to kill kids who disagrees with them I've said it once and I'll say it again real authoritarianism real authoritarianism will always try to convince you that it's a democracy first. And none of that shit has changed in the last 50 years. Both sides are doing the same thing. Democrats, Republicans, they're both doing the same thing. They all talk about freedom and patriotism and nationalistic pride and America first. And, you know, this is a country of democracy. Your voice matters, baby. Your voice matters. We love your voice. We want to hear more of it. We want you to express yourself. Get out there, you know, take your fucking guns, shoot it in the air, pop, 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 pop. That's your opinion right there. That's your second and your first fused into one very loud, repetitive, concurrent noise. Both sides of the aisle want to do that. Meanwhile, they'll put laws into place, like the Patriot Act, that takes away your rights. Like what the NSA is doing. And then 58% of America looks at them and goes, well, well, those people that revealed the truth are the bad guys. Those people that are, that are saying that we're in illegal wars after we've been proven that they were illegal wars, those are the bad guys. Those are good guys. And unfortunately, when we see real good guys in the world, uh, they die. Now... I don't want to leave it on that t terribly depressing note, right? I, I do believe that there is a shift in the, in the narrative. I do believe that more people are coming out and being more anti-war. They are uh, supporting veterans a lot more. Because when you're anti-war, you're pro-veteran. Uh, because you don't want to see any more fucking veterans. How more pro-veteran could that possibly get? Um, we're seeing that, you know that uh, the military industrial complex does fit into a class war because it's always the underprivileged middle class um, communities that get co-opted by the military in promises of riches and pride and all this other stuff um, to go die for, you know, making the already rich even richer. And I think a lot more people are seeing that. And what we need to do is stand up and fight to make sure that this sort of stuff doesn't happen. So when you see military intervention um, used by America, when you see 
you know, someone like Mike Pompeo get on television and, and say things like, oh, we got to stop Iran or, you know, Nicolas Maduro will never govern uh, Venezuela again. You got to look at that and challenge that shit. You got to look at that and go, what the fuck does this former head of the CIA, why does he not want Nicolas Maduro in charge? Why is he trying to engage in a hot war with Iran in the middle of a global pandemic when the rest of the world has ordered a ceasefire? So you got, we, we, I think there's a lot more people ready to question that right now. And those questions should be encouraged. Um, so I, you know, I, I do hope that more and more people become anti-war. I, I do. Because these Kent State uh, protests are important. We shouldn't be looking at anti-war protesters as traitors to the country. They are the most patriotic people there are. Anti-war protesters might be the most patriotic people on the planet. So support them. Because they, because that's, because that's what we need to do with for each other is support each other. Anyway, uh, I think that's uh, that's a good place to to um, end today's uh, lesson, sermon, whatever this is for you. Um, wrapping up. Thank you guys for tuning in. Um, I hope that was informative. I hope you guys have a better picture of of you know what the the history of these these events are. Um, I do. I, I, I like looking this sort of stuff up and, and learning the truth beyond it and, and f trying to figure out like what we can do going forward, you know, because we're going to see this sort of stuff again. We're going to see anti-war uh, activists being called brown shirts and being compared to uh, fascist regimes and things of that sort. And once we kind of know that that's the tactic that they're using, they can't use those tactics against us anymore because we've educated ourselves. We have the knowledge base behind it. Um, and and we're when we're better for it. What's going on, everybody? If you enjoyed this video, there is more stuff like this coming on this channel. So make sure you hit that subscribe button. Hit that bell icon to make sure you're getting updates about my videos. Make sure you hit that like button because uh, I think there's a dislike campaign happening on the channel. There's like one person that's just disliking all my shit. That's weird. Uh, but uh, make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you hit the share button. Get the word out about this channel. Uh, and there are going to be more videos like this. But if you enjoyed this video and you want to be a part of the live comedy experience in this virtual world that we're living in now, uh, where, uh, where all the performance art is going virtual uh, for the time being, you can join my Zoom live stand-up comedy shows. It's called the Citizen Revolution Comedy Show. Uh, the first one is on May 8th, uh, and they will be consecutively every other week. All of the dates are available on my website right now, ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com. Go grab your tickets right now. They're only five bucks. Five bucks gets you in, um, and it's five bucks per residence, not five bucks per person. Uh, it's just to grab you a spot. Uh, so go to my website, ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com. Grab your ticket. Come hang out with me. Uh, if you can, you can become a sustaining member over on the website. Sustaining members get free tickets uh, to come see the Zoom virtual Citizen Revolution comedy show. Um, or you can make a one-time donation as well. Uh, but all of this stuff helps keep me afloat, uh, keeps me uh, being able to put food on the table, uh, and cover all of my bills and expenses uh, to make sure that I'm putting out regular content. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for subscribing. Hope to see you again. Stay safe.